Howdy, folks. Welcome back to the Johnson County Libraries Writers Conference. This is module two of Finding Your Story's Voice. If you haven't already peeked at module one, you might want to backtrack and go have a look. These modules uh, do build on each other. We are going to be deconstructing different components of, you know, finding your story's voice. <laughs> so last week, we just talked about different kinds of voices, starting to train our ear to hear the voices. And now we're going to, uh, you know, do some craft stuff. We're going to do craft deconstruction and look for the pieces, uh, you know, the tricks of the trade that really lets these writers connect to a very full-bodied experience. Um, I'm not going to be doing much on dialogue here. This is mostly about the narrative. Narrative. Uh, so everything that's not dialogue and then of course narrative is divided into different pieces and parts you know we have scene description we have interiority which is uh, uh you know the character's inner monologue the thoughts um there's memories built into this uh flashbacks um there's certainly going to be you know projections into the future as the character tries to sort out what it is which falls under interiority but uh, it's not always i guess what i want to say is interiority isn't always it's just, um, oh gosh, um, uh, you know, I thought to myself, well, I better get to the store quick. Lots of times it's also the the feelings that they're having about you know, what's going on, but it can also be them um Oh, boiling down you know, what they just heard and then making a plan for the future. Interiority can carry a lot of the heavy lifting. So it's kind of a voice within the voice because you've got the voice of, like I said, the scene description. And but then you also have the character who is talking to themselves slash talking to us. Oh, it just gets so complicated. It's not complicated at all. You all have been reading for a very long time. You know all this stuff. I'm just kind of pointing things out. So so what today is going to be dedicated to is looking at examples from different genres uh, that are really pretty aggressive examples from each genre. <laughs> Again, it's easier to learn from things that are written in sort of an extreme style. Uh, I'm not saying that you have to write in these extreme styles. We're just using them for studying them. And we're going to go through the different genres. Um, this is one of the easiest ways to start tapping into what is the right voice for your story. Uh, there are or audience expectations, you know, they expect a Western to sound like a Western. They expect, um, you know, a historical that is based in Victorian times to sound a very specific way. Uh, you know, they're expecting a fantasy while the, you know, the fantasy world may be something they've never seen before. They're still expecting some of these narrative, I'm going to call them tropes, um, tricks, uh, whatever, whatever we want to call it, in order for them to know that they are experiencing a fantasy. And it's actually pretty easy to do. It really does just come down to word choice, being selective about the word choice. So we're going to go through, um, golly, we're going to do con comedy, we're going to do drama, uh, we're going to do some fantasy, some sci-fi, a tiny bit of historical, um, and then, uh, ooh, and then let's get into some mystery. And then if you can stomach it, like you don't have to stick around for this one, but um, I want to do some horror too. Um, I've been meeting a lot of horror writers in Kansas City, so I wanted to make sure I honored that as well. All right, so those are the basics. The audience are expecting it to sound in a certain way. It helps you tell your story because you are living in a universe that has already been developed by, you know, thousands of writers. And that universe is the genre universe. It's already been developed and, and lived in by lots of people that has sort of created, uh, uh, I mean, you know, the ruts in the road. I don't know. Um, I kind of like having examples that I can draft and then looking for ways to make it uniquely my own. So first, let's look at who's been there before us. Um, I'm going to have a little drink of water, and then we're going to get into some Prince of Tides. We're going to do some drama right away. Um, Prince of Tides, Pat Conroy. This isn't just drama. You know, I was kind of uh, teasing the, the beach reads in module one. 
because the, the voices don't tend to be overly complex. Uh, they're not drawing, the writers aren't drawing a lot of attention to what it is that they're doing. They're just getting the story out in as economically pleasing a way as possible. But there are some writers, oh yes, there are. There are some writers who are just called, called to the lyricism, called to the melodrama, and boy howdy, that is Pat Conroy. So if you are interested in the more melodramatic side of things, I can't recommend him enough. And this book in particular is mind-bendingly good. All right, so I'm just going to read a paragraph from this. When my father left for the shrimp boat the next morning, I lay awake in my bed hearing some small, unidentified animal yelping in the darkness. I couldn't tell if it was a wildcat had crawled beneath the house to have her kittens or what the sound was. Leaving my bed, I got dressed without waking Luke. I walked into the living room and heard the noise coming from Savannah's bedroom. Before I knocked, I listened to my sister's violently suppressed weeping, that murderous coming apart of the soul that would become both the recessional and the trademark of her madness. I entered her room quietly, fearfully, and found her clutching something tightly to her chest. There was such anguish in her cries that I almost did not disturb her, but there was a scoured raw quality about Savannah's pathetic sorrowing that I could never walk away from. I turned her over in and in a kind of daze or seizure of brotherly pity, I pried her arms loose from the cold, still body of Rose Astor. Oh, you know, he comes up like thesauruses, people. It's your friend. <laughs> he comes up with so many different ways to say, you know, to, to speak to Savannah's crying. Uh, and he draws us further and further. There's great suspense here because first it's the animal yelping, which really self sets the stage. Um, and, you know, and, you know, the, the giving birth to her uh, kittens. And then we find out, oh, there's, there's, there's a dead child in, in their house and Savannah is mourning it. Um, and we don't know that until we're creeping closer and closer along with the brother. So Pat Conroy is using pacing to very slowly ease us into this terrible moment. But he's also giving us details about their world. You know, he shares a bedroom with another person, Luke. Uh, it's his brother. Um uh, you know, he doesn't tell us that, this, that he that he is a sibling among siblings, but I'll just give that to you. Um, you know, his dad goes out on the shrimp boat, so we get a sense of what, you know, the family trade is. Um, but mostly what we really, really are exposed to. So talk about melodrama. Wow. Like really going deep, deep, deep into this witnessing of Savannah's uh, crying. Um, this is a great challenge for all writers that if you are trying to connect with the emotions of your characters, uh, write a prompt for yourself where they are witnessing somebody that you know they really care about mourning something. And how does that come across and see how deeply into the emotions that you can go? Because really, that's the, the that's the heart of drama is making sure that we are there for the emotional ride of our characters. And therefore, the narrative description, you know, the scene description all needs to match that tone. If we veer off tone and go too light while there's a really heavy emotional moment, then we've lost our audience. Right. Um, we were not lost in that moment moment. I, I always get swept away. And um, once I start it, I have to, you can see, I <laughs> I pull this book apart tons. Um, it's just masterful melodramatic writing. Okay, so for now for something completely different. Um, how about some Dave Barry, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> He is uh, oh, just a terrific comedy writer. Um, he's a columnist. He is a, uh, you know, he's a novelist. He writes a lot about Florida. He might have been the person who invented uh, the phrase, the Florida man. I don't know. I'd like to give him credit for it, if so. So I am going to read a column of his. So this is creative nonfiction. This is a personal essay that he wrote, and it is called How to Make a Board. Most of what I know about cop carpentry is, which is almost nothing, I learned in shop. Under Mr. Schmidt's guidance, we hammered out hundreds of the ugliest and most useless objects the human mind can conceive of. 
Our first major project was a little bookshelf that you could also use as a stool. The idea was that someday you'd be looking for a book and all of a sudden you'd urgently need a stool so that you just dump the books on the floor and there you'd be. At least I assume that was the thinking behind the bookshelf stool. Mr. Schmidt designed it and we started, students sure knew better than to ask any questions. I regret today that I didn't take more shop in high school because while I never once used anything I know about the cuisine and the tangent, I have used my shop skills to make many useful objects for my home. For example, I recently made a board. I use my board in many ways. I stand on it when I have to get socks out of the dryer and water has been sitting in our basement around the dryer for a few days and has developed a pretty healthy layer of scum on top. Plus, heaven only knows what new and predatory forms of life underneath. I also use my board to squash spiders. All spiders are deadly killers. Don't believe any of the stuff you read in National Geographic. If you'd like to make a board, you'll need materials, a board, paint tools, a chisel, a handgun. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop there. Um, oh, what a delight Dave Barry is. Um, you know, he takes such average everyday moments and he's able to bring this lightness of touch. I think that the key in comedy uh, is, is, is going to the unexpected. Like that last moment where, you know, he's talking about like the tools you're going to need. He's like nails and a handgun. <laughs> And you're thinking to yourself, what is the handgun for? And it creates this conversation, you know. So drama is about tying the emotional ride to your characters. Comedy is about, oh, no, what next? Oh, no, what next? Oh, no, what next? <laughs> There's lots of different kinds of comedy. And I and if this is your jam, um, fantastic. You must be great at dinner parties. Because if you're not naturally funny, it can be very, very hard to, like, learn to get funny on the page. Not impossible. But, you know, take a comedy class class. Um, I did once with the TV writer um, and he explained the seven different ways to build a joke. And uh, I had to tell you, I think I, I think I might have blacked out because after the third one, I realized how deeply unfunny I actually was. Or or let me correct that, how, how little I really understood about comedy <laughs> and how much I would have to study it if I were ever going to get good at it. But uh, those of you who appreciate comedy, please, please go forth. I'm going to read you a little bit of Bullet of the Brain, Tobias Wolf. Um, who masterfully veers between drama and comedy throughout all of his writing. He's known as one of the best short story writers, um, I don't know, in, in America, certainly, and in mostly modern times here. Um, and this is one of my all-time favorite shorts of his. Uh, again, it's called Bullet in the Brain. Anders couldn't get to the bank until just after it closed. So, of course, the line was endless and he got stuck behind two women whose loud, stupid conversation put him in a murderous temper. He was never in the best of tempers anyway. Anders, a book credit known for the weary, elegant savagery, which with he dispatched almost everything he reviewed. I'm just going to stop there. There's a lot to chew on just right there. Uh, we get, uh, you know, the uh, big words, right? So if you're working with somebody who comes from, a, you know, an intellectual background, you really want to mimic that um, just uh, as if you were working with somebody who is not from a very educated background, you wouldn't want to bring in a lot of, uh, you know, MFA words. <laughs> But this is an MFA kind of guy. He's a book critic. Um, so words are kind of everything for him. So we're getting introduced to the world of words right away uh, in this opening paragraph. And then there's some foreshadowing going on in there. We've got a murderous temper. We have elegant, weary savagery with which he dispressed. There are two mentions of death in the opening paragraph but in a funny kind of way. So we're a little bit off guard. We're not sure what to expect moving forward. This is a savagely funny essay that, that ends up landing in such aching sincerity at the end that it will kind of destroy you. If you read the short story, um, take a few minutes afterwards because you're going to need it to process what you just saw. But these are some of his tricks, right, is to write things at this very high level, juxtapose it with loud, stupid conversation <laughs> so that Anders can continue to judge and judge and judge, and then return us to a moment of uh, of just beautiful nostalgia. Um, again, it's called Bullet in the Brain. Um, 
yeah, it's kind of it's it's kind of a masterpiece. And it's a wonderful example of dramedy, um, of being able to go back and forth between the drama aspects of your story and the comedy aspects. Some people feel like they should be separated somehow. Like if it's going to be drama, we need to stay in the drama. But um, I'm going to recommend that you always look for opportunities to bring in a lighter touch uh, in, in every aspect of your storytelling, just so the audience doesn't forget that there is meant to be comedy in here. Because if you just do straight drama, Drama, and, and suddenly you start cracking jokes, um, it's going to throw your audience off. So veering between the dramatic and the comedy and the dramatic and the comedy can be really fun for your readers and can be just right for your particular story. All right, so let's get into the actual speculative genres. Um, let me go back to my notes here and let's see which one is up first. Um, all right, fantasy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so the next three we're going to look into fantasy, sci fi, and historical all have the same principles driving uh, the, the creation of the voice, and that is world building. I talked a little bit about this in module one. <sighs> Fantasy needs to sound fantastical. Okay, great, but how do you do that? You know, sci-fi should sound sci-fi-ish. Um, historical should sound like the era um, and the place that it takes place in. And now I'm Willy Wonka and the schnozzleberry should taste like schnozzleberry. How do you do it? A big piece of this is knowing enough about how your world operates in order to infuse every moment with what's happening in the world. So even if it's a contemporary sci-fi or fantasy or you know a historical that's only 20 only, only 20 years past, there's still going to be elements to the world that is going to help hold us in that space and you know and, and sort of remind us. Fantasy tends to have, you know, lots of magic that's kind of their jam and sci-fi is um <laughs> it's what fantasy is when science finally catches up with magic, but we'll get there. So uh, there's two different kinds. Well, there's lots of different kinds of fantasy. Um, but if you are writing high or epic fantasy, it's going to sound like medieval English. So now you have to go back and study the historical sound of what the medieval times were because again that's the audience expectation they're expecting it to sound like king arthur's court even you know even if there's no king arthur um if it's a uh, a lighter fantasy then you want to make sure that you don't go too dark and heavy and suspenseful with the language um you want to keep things on the lighter side uh, so in your word choice and in your story choices, um, big, heavy things can happen, but you don't want to go into a place where now you're terrifying your audience, <laughs> unless that's the point of your fantasy is to terrify them with the, you know, the magic that is afoot. Um, and the other big component of all fantasies is politics. Fantasies are, now I'm telling you like the secrets of, of the tropes behind these different genres, but fantasy, it's about uh, either a, a utopia or something that seems like a utopia, and then somebody in that utopia wakes up and goes, oh, wait, no, wait, it's only a utopia for like these, these sets of people, and it's usually on the backs of a bunch of oppressed people. So they disrupt the utopia um, and create a dystopia, but from that dystopia, there's a bigger chance that a more equitable utopia, a true utopia can be built out of it. Or it's, you know, Hunger Games. Um, we're in the dystopia. Um, there is a utopia. It's the capital. But we're over here with Katniss and it is the worst possible world. And she is not going to stand for it. And she ends up disrupting the entire uh, political system that was built so that the people in the capital uh, could have what they have and try to make uh, a, a, an attempt where the different, um, oh, I forget what they're called, but the different um, cycles, um, district, that's what it's called, the districts can have a better chance at equality. Um, yeah, so that people like her little sister and her mother don't starve to death. So there you go. Those are the politics that happen behind sci-fi. So you need to know, you need to know those politics. 
but then you also, and also you need to know the magic and then you will infuse your world with, uh, with, with whatever that magic is. All right. So let's go to page 62. Um, is that it? I think that's it. Gosh, did I pull the wrong? No, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. All right. I'm just going to read a little bit here. Um, <laughs> Penny had no sense of humor at all. He practiced by himself, murmuring and watching his pale hand sign and flutter in a massive Baroque gilt-framed mirror leaned up against the wall. The mirror had an old, fading, forgotten enchantment on it, so Penny's reflection was sometimes replaced with an image of a, a treeless greenhouse side, a smooth, grassy curve under an overcast sky. It was like a TV with a poorly installed cable box picking up a stray image from far away some other world that's all i'm gonna read that's all you need <laughs> so it's the singular moment um you know where this this person penny is practicing their magic in front of an enchanted mirror and then it explains the details you know how the mirror works um it's very lyrical uh this is basically um you know, another Magic Academy book, but it's jaded. <laughs> it's what happens when you are, I don't know, the the chosen ones, um, but the world doesn't care. <laughs> so there is some politics going on in here, um, even though they are exceptional um, and they all have exceptional magic. Uh, they are not necessarily deploying it for the betterment of mankind. Uh, and we get to have all of the same tropes that we expect from Magic Academy books, where we're introduced to the Academy, we meet all the players, you know, everybody is sort of painted with certain skills, um, we learn, you know, their class load, we get to watch them struggle learning magic, um, there's romance afoot, there's rivalries afoot, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the story is very familiar, but it's always it's the details, you guys. It's the it's the way you build the magic for us that sweeps us into all of it. So that's what you're looking for when you are reading your fantasy books and trying to find the voice. So let's hop over here to sci-fi. Um, boy, howdy. Okay, so just like there's different kinds of um, fantasy, there's also different kinds of sci-fi. Uh, if it's hard sci-fi, uh, you better go do your research because this is going to be, you know, hard sci-fi is about like, like real, real world physics, real world science. So you can't get away with making anything up. It's got to be grounded in things that can actually happen. Um, you know, if it's lots, if it's, you know, sort of regular sci-fi, whatever that means, you know, it's just lots of world details. Um, the more, the more technology you can infuse into the sci-fi world, the happier your audience is going to be, because that's kind of what we're there for, um, is to see all of the inventive new things that, uh, they, you know, that humans have invented. But here's where the, uh, the theme comes in. Sci-fi is always about a technology that humans have invented, but, um, you know, we don't have the emotional intelligence to be able to keep up with it. So it, uh, it destroys us. <laughs> Or it, or it tries to destroy us and we are struggling to push back. It's kind of fun to see that no, it's not fun. It's fun is the wrong word. Let's take that word back. I don't know what I would replace it with though. It's very interesting to watch AI right now because it's this perfect uh, real-time example of a technology that we have created that we probably don't know enough about to be deploying it. Probably the last time we had this big of a technology that was going to come in and be very disruptive to us is, uh, you know, nuclear bombs. Um, the internet has worked out pretty well as far as I'm concerned, though. So who's to say? All right. So um, I'm a huge fan of Larry Niven. Ringworld is one of my all-time favorites. Yes, it was written back in the 70s. And, uh, and sci-fi behaved differently in book form back then. Um, but it's still a really great example. So I'm just going to open it up with Louis Wu. In the nighttime heart of Beirut, in one of a row of general address transfer booths, Louis Wu flicked, flicked into reality. His foot-length queue was as white and shiny as artificial snow. His skin and dilapidated scalp were chrome yellow. 
The irises of his eyes were gold. His robe was royal blue with a golden stereoptic dragon superimposed. In the instant he appeared, he was smiling widely, showing pearly, perfect, perfectly standard teeth, smiling and waving, but the smile was already fading, and in a moment it was gone, and the sag of his face was like a rubber mask melting. Louis Wu showed his age. How many different technologies <laughs> do we get? And we don't always encourage people to open your book with like a description of the character unless you can uh, invert the trope. We are we are hearing about his description because there was not one piece of it that was human, that wasn't doctored, that wasn't remade with some kind of technology. We are getting the sense that humans in this world not only have the access to transfer booths, uh, so maybe teleportation, maybe. Well, we haven't quite gotten to the science of it, but also people don't look like humans anymore. We're already setting the stage for what the ring world has for us. Um, all right. Historical. Um, it's all of the same thing, but this is, man, I hope you love research. If you want to do historical, even if it was historical in your lifetime, there's so many things that you've forgotten about what the 90s or the 2000s or even the 2010s. Yes, that's considered historical now. <laughs> Makes me laugh. Anyway, but you, there's so many things that you have forgotten about that time. So you got to go back and really immerse yourself or remind yourself what the, not just what the culture pieces were, um, how people dressed and what they were listening to and you know what, what foods they were eating but also the language of things but also the the emotional lives that people were living because it was while it while it, first frustratingly so humans are the same or the same or the same or the same or the same all throughout history and yet there are different pressures on them that are making them uh you know have the emotional reactions that they do um, yeah, so go do lots and lots of research. I also invite you go find lots of books that are from in fiction books um, or creative nonfiction books uh, or screenplays that are specifically about yes, even in screenplays, you need to write historical if it's if it's a history because there's nothing weirder than reading modern language describing you know the 1880s. It just doesn't work. It's it's a cognitive dissonance and we can't and we can't go with it. So go do your research. Go read other books that and and you know and like I said, it's no shame in drafting drafting what other people are doing, but then for your own edification, uh, go do the specific research that pertains to your story so that you can do lots of uh, scene work in there. Um, I'm working with a client right now who has a dynamite story um, about a particular war from 150 years ago that not American um, elsewhere in the world, and I can't picture any of it because she hasn't yet done the, the research that tells us like what the uniforms look like, what the landscape look like what kinds of weapons they used the way they spoke to each other um yeah none of it feels lived in yet and that's really what the goal is anytime you're doing one of uh these speculative things is to be as lived in that universe as possible i do feel like we're running a little long so i'm going to skip reading something uh historical um because there's <sighs> Because anything I pick, it's only going to be one example of that year and that time. It's a snapshot. And historical literally is going to be different based on the year and the where and the year and the where, but also like the classes. Are you, you know, which which aspect of the class system are you working in? Um, you know, uh, what their uh, jobs were um, is also going to have a big determination about the details that you bring in. So you can see why I'm skipping it because one example is like 0 0.001. <laughs> of what is possible in historical. Use the same tools we've been talking about. All right. Uh, romance. I mean, it's got to sound romantic. Although I got to tell you, I feel like a lot of modern rom-com has gotten kind of jaded uh, at the, certainly at the beginning where there's folks who have sort of given up or never even bought into the concept of romance at all. And the book's job is to sort of convince them that romance still lives. Um, okay. Doesn't hurt to go do your research and to see what the market, you know, trends are, but I never encourage anybody to follow the trends. 
but it might be a voice that's right for your story that you start as far away as from romance as you possibly can and then the arc of the story is really grounding it in uh you know in true love because that's what romance is always about is the happily ever after now there's also lots and lots and lots of by the way romance is the number one seller of all published books it is the back upon which all other books get published all hail romance. <laughs> but there's different kinds of romance, right? So there's a romantic comedy over here, um, which may or may not start off with the two as enemies and then they're forced to work together and you know they finally 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 realize well we knew from page three that they were meant to be together or it's the inverse where um they oh it's true love right away it's right away true love and then they are separated by circumstances and it's them fighting their way back to each other that's pretty much the two directions that romance go in again your audience oh boy if you read romance you know all the tropes so if you're a romance writer please go and um you know and really invest some time in knowing what your audience is expecting to see and then trying to figure out ways that you can you know own it for yourself um i'm going to do one that's on the more sincere and melodramatics at the more romantic side um and I, i'm so sorry i forgot to write down what this uh what this book was i apologize the woodland scent of him made her swoon by the way that word you only get to use it three times in a romance, um, even though it's the go-to word. Readers pay attention to word choice, so you can't be too redundant. You can't say swoon more than three times. <laughs> I don't make the rules, man. I'm just reporting them. Anyway, the woodland scent of him made her swoon, but she'd never let him know it. She kept her racing heart beat to herself by holding her books to her chest. She kept her flushed cheeks from his sight by letting her long, straight raven hair fall forward and cover her face. There was once the possibility they could have found solace in one another, but the moment he'd been cruel to her little sister, she had banished him from her mind. Oh, so this tiny little moment, he's mean to her sister and like banishment. <laughs> banish is a great so everything's kind of exaggerated we're going into that melodrama uh place again you know i have a friend who uh switches back and forth between romance and cozy mysteries she's a very well published author and what she does is she creates a word collage because she's like my brain gets whiplash going between the two genres because they don't like the word choices are completely different in both of them and she literally went and generated word lists so that she could remind herself what the words are the raven hair the swooning the woodland scent uh, the flushed cheeks um these are all Wow. And all of them in one paragraph. <laughs> I kid because I love. All right. Uh, let's do our last two and we will call it uh, a day on this module. I think this is our longest module. So thanks for your patience. Um, obviously, you are, you are, you're welcome to go at your own pace or skip the modules that just don't, not the modules, but the, the genres that just don't um, apply to you. I probably should have mentioned that at the beginning so that you would have known to be like, don't care about, you know, fantasy and sci-fi. Don't care about this. Um, but I'm sure you figured it out. All right, mystery, 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 mystery. Mystery, suspense, thriller, horror, they all live in the same thematic genre bucket. They are all about um, wrongs that are happening um, or have happened and somebody is trying to set them right. Um, suspense, suspense, suspense. It's all about using the language so that it's controlled release of information so that we don't get all the information right away. We're always asking questions. Our characters are always, um, you know, in pursuit of uh, elucidation of truth, truthiness, um, perceptions of truth. If it's noir, it's perceptions of truth um, because the truth in noir is always the same. And that is, there's nothing you can do to win. They've already, they've already, uh, <laughs> you, you are, it is above your pay grade. You will lose. Terrible. But there you go. That's the theme of noir. Um, over here in mystery, again, it's just about justice, um, unless uh, it's veering off over here into revenge. Uh, there tends to be a fair number of revenge books out there. There didn't used to be, but that is a thing now. Um, the true crime thing. So if you're writing creative uh, nonfiction in the true crime space, it is written precisely the same way as, you know, regular mysteries are. So do, do your homework and check 
out the kinds of word choices and the way that you the way you don't spill everything right away, the way you build sentences um, for for maximum um, uh, edginess. Um, again, it's just it's suspense. I don't know what else to call it. The big difference between mystery and thrillers and horror body count. In a mystery suspense, no, or maybe one dead body. Um, cozies, no dead bodies. None. We don't play that game in cozies. Over here in thrillers, eh, one to three dead bodies. Four, all bets are off. We're there for the gore. Um, we are there for all the inventive ways in which people are dispatched. And hey, if that's your jam, especially in the movie world, it does very also in publishing, it does very well. Humans like to be terrified, apparently. All right. Um, so this is one of my all-time favorite books. There is a, a gentleman out there named Stephen Graham Jones, um, award-winning. Um, he is an award-winning horror writer. <laughs> it's very hard to do. And he's just a dazzling talent. This is one of my favorites of his. Um, all right. Um <clears throat> This is the mystery side of things. So what we're listening for here is, you know, shadows and whispers and, um, um, I don't know, looks thrown about and uh, closed doors that are nervously open, this sort of thing. Uh, let's see. Let me actually let me back up. Um, I woke sometime later, unaware I'd even been asleep. It was like I just blinked in the slideshow of pasture that had advanced to the next frame. But then I saw what had opened my eyes, crawling like a bug across the brown, a rancher's truck. It was cruising along the fence, dragging a plume of dirt, moving from gate to gate, I guessed. Because he was going too fast to be looking for a lost heifer or scoping the buzzards. I didn't flick an eyebrow, just let him slip past. In a perfect world, he'd have been pulling a flat trailer of hay, and I'd have been able to hide under the tarp for as long as he was going my way, maybe longer, to wherever he parked the rest of the trucks. As it was, I just waited for his dust to settle and fell in behind him. An hour, of sh uh, an hour shy of dark, I came to that gate he'd been headed for, and just for the ritual op of it, opened it to walk through and then shut it behind me. On top of it, I balanced the stump of the silver nitrate stick I'd been chewing on all afternoon so that it would fall onto the boots of whoever opened it. Usually, I'd never leave any sign that I'd been in a place. First off, dazzling writing. Dazzling writing. He he could have just straight up told us that there was a truck, you know, uh, going down the road, uh, pick, kicking up dust. But he uses these amazingly artful ways. Um, even the slideshow of the pasture when your eyes close and when they open, he he's trying to find inventive ways in order to depict that moment that gives us more, you know, information about this universe. Um, it's a very still moment. So sometimes when things are very still and mysteries have a lot of still moments where you're watching and you're trying not to be seen, guess what's happening here? <laughs> he is watching and trying not to be seen, uh, which makes it so unusual why he left that stick behind because now there is a trace of him. <laughs> and we're thinking, well, why did he do that? Um, yes, so many questions dazzling here, but at the same time, we also get very good information about what the world looks like. You know, it's a rancher's uh, world. It is, uh, you know, there's a lot of dust um, and it's ranch land. So the guess is that it's not a lot of trees, right? That it's going to be flat and barren. So we're able to kind of build out the things he doesn't tell us in our mind with the things that he does tell us. And this is one of the fun push and pulls of the information that you give us. I will say that there are times that my world building writers will, um, I always laugh at Tolkien because he'll do like 20 pages on a feast and he has to describe every single food eaten and in those moments I'll like flip past it and be like I don't care I don't care I don't care what pudding I don't care what are the doors don't care just get me back to the action <laughs> so beware my world builders that there you can you can do the overriding so that you can show yourself that you have explored the world sufficiently in your imagination but at some point like 
oh boy, enough is enough. Just give us the most vital details. Um, that also helps in your finding your world, uh, the, the, the voice for your story's world. Because if this is something that does want to depict lots and lots of details, like in epic fantasy has a tendency to do lots and lots of details of what the world looks like. Awesome. That's your jam. That's your space. Your audience is expecting that. But in other genres, we can like all of the tension and suspense will fall out of your story if we're just spending three pages describing, I don't know, um, a throne room. Um, yeah, there you go. All right. Side bonus, um, because I'm now giving my people who don't want to hear some horror writing a chance to fast forward ahead. Look for the slide with the homework. I'm going to do a, a screen share with the homework for this week. And that's how you, you learn how you will know that I am done with the horror of it all. All right. Um, oh, boy. <clears throat> you ready? Same book. Slowly, so as not to just to sorry, slowly, so as not to rouse the security light, I balled my hands into fists. What I was doing was telling myself now over and over for what felt like minutes. Instead, my dad came to me, the security light flaring in his first step out onto the porch. I didn't scream either, but it was an effort. He wasn't wearing his face anymore, but somebody else's loose around the eyes and jaws. He pulled it over his head just like he had done with the rabbit. It was him though. Even after 15 years, I knew it. There was something about the way he stood in the doorway, half in, half out, a certain hesitation to his step or posture that I would know anywhere, I think. I'll know that forever. That's plenty. She's meeting the monster, and the monster is somebody that she used to love, her father. Boy, howdy, if you can bring real emotion into your horror, you're going to do triple duty <laughs> with your readers, because it's not just the horror of a monster doing the thing that I just read that he did, but it's also the horror that this used to be your dad, and what was he now? <sighs> Oh, dazzling. All right, I'm done. Let's go to a shared screen and I will show you your homework. This was a long one. I appreciate you guys hanging in. Um, the others won't be this long, but in order to cover all the genres and to show you the differentiations, we needed the time. All right, so for module tool, genre, pull books from the exact, the exact same genre as yours. So remember how I said like in fantasy, there's all kinds of subgenres and sci-fi, there's all kinds of subgenres, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so find something that is as close to what you're doing as possible. Um, find a few of them. You should be reading into your subgenre. But now we're going to deconstruct. This is a craft exercise with a pencil. Start marking the words or the phrases that you feel help evoke the world. Um, you know, the tone of things and certainly like the genre things. Um, so what do you what do you notice about the word choice and the sentence structure? If you can kind of tie those two things together, that this writer chose these phrases and these words and, uh, you know, the, the, the structure of the sentences, sometimes like especially in action, very, very short phrases, very different than what we saw with Ray Bradbury last, uh, you know, last module why those kinds of sentence structures and we'll get into that more in uh in module four all right so that's the first thing now the second thing is this is your writing prompt your writing exercise take a scene from your own work and write it in a completely different genre go bananas go bananas if you are doing i don't know a, a high epic fantasy write it like a modern rom-com <laughs> really challenge yourself here and you want to try to make use of as many of these you know these tropiness words that we were talking about and this is just guys this is just play this is just to kind of open up uh, you know the, the creative instrument and to really demonstrate to you that you understand first off that you had chosen a voice and maybe it's not completely refined by now but it certainly isn't 
the wrong, wrong, wrong voice because you're not writing in the wrong genres tendencies. Have fun with this one. Um, yes. And then I also included a, uh, a terrific website on there that breaks down um, the dozens and dozens of tropes. These are more like story oriented or character build oriented tropes for the different genres so that you can, uh, I don't know, learn or refresh your memory about the kinds of things that we very, very commonly see in each of these genres. But again, it's not about not doing them. It's about doing them in an inventive way, in a way that's unique to you. Your writers will thank you for it. They get to have their trope, but then they also get it served up in a special new way. There you go, folks. That is module two. Thanks for hanging in. We'll see you for module three here in, uh, yeah, as soon as you're ready for it. Cheers.